this last week I was in Texas, which is always an interesting experience. No offense to the Texans who might be here. And I was at Texas A&M University at St. Mary's Catholic Student Center. And I was there with the hope of walking with young people and discerning their direction and their call from God. The hope that I might meet some young men that would have an inspiration to want to move all the way to New Mexico, be a Norbertine, and come serve you all. It's a very narrow market, so we have to cast a very wide net. And as I'm there, one afternoon, sitting in this big atrium space they have where all the students gather and they're preparing for finals and they're all stressed. So of course what students do when they're preparing for finals and stressed is they do everything they can to avoid doing the finals and acknowledging the stress. So they enter into a big debate about the Polar Express. Now for all of them, who are in their late teens and early 20s, Polar Express was a movie of their childhood. And they start debating inconsistencies in the storyline and trying to find the theological significance of what's going on in the Polar Express. Now, if you're not familiar with it, one of the key components of the story of the Polar Express is this bell. This bell that seems to have no sound unless you believe, in which case you can hear it. So as they're debating this, I said, I think you might be missing some elements because in my childhood, the movie did not exist, but the book did. Well, they were dumbfounded. They were like, there was a book? <laughs> I was like, yes, there was an era when people read. It was true. So we went and actually in the bookstore, not near, not too far by, they, they had it and we went and got it, brought it back and, and went through it. But it was an interesting testament to their yearning for a way to understand the significance of faith. To understand the power of what it is to give ourselves in belief to something before we fully understand it. If we have total comprehension of what's going on, then it's not faith, it's just facts. But while I was also there, you can imagine, I'm sure this may happen to you when you travel. The one thing Albuquerque is known for is Breaking Bad. So everyone's like, yeah, you're, you're from the Breaking Bad place, right? It's true, I am. The challenge with that is sometimes that fictional reality can seem all too real. The Tuesday before Thanksgiving, we laid to rest from our parish church here, Jackie Vigil, the woman who was shot in her driveway one morning on her way to the gym. Mother of two state police officers, for no apparent reason. It can seem that in this time of hope, these holiday seasons when we go from feast to feast to celebration to celebration to moments of joy and family. So many of us are also struggling with loss, conflict, division, pain. And so when we walk in those spaces, it can seem absurd when we hear from the prophet Isaiah this vision of a world in which the wolf shall be the guest of the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion shall browse together and the cow and the bear shall be neighbors and the lion shall eat hay like the ox. These images that put apparent contradictions together that take beings that should be enemies or predator and prey and find a place for them to coexist. You can say, how, how could that be, Isaiah? Like really, what, what were you smoking? What was going on then <laughs> that made you think that in a world as dark and broken and divided and complex and painful as this, that the very thing I fear the most will be my companion? How? 
Well, as I was kind of carrying the weight of Jackie's funeral into Thanksgiving, of course, Thanksgiving I celebrated at the Abbey with my brothers, but that was in the evening. During the day, I had to go pay a visit to my mother, or there'd be a lot of darkness in the earth. <laughs> and so as I go, my little nephew, Chao Rong, runs up to me as myself and Brother Patricio and Brother Alexis and some others that I brought with me come into the house, and I say, Happy Thanksgiving, Chao Rong. And he says, I am not Chao Rong. I am a white blood cell, and I am killing viruses. <laughs> now he's four. I was like, well, well thank you. That's, I mean, we're on the, the threshold of flu season. That's, a, that's an important thing to do. Um, a little bit later, we're sitting in the living room, and he starts running around as fast as he can, the couches. And I was like, you're going pretty fast for a white blood cell. He says, I am not a white blood cell. I am an electron. I said, oh, wow. But it was in that moment that I had a glimpse of a certain sense of what the human imagination can accomplish that when we're no longer children, we so easily lose track of. The ability to vision something that seems completely unimaginable. The ability to grasp something that is beyond our understanding. The ability to trust that something that seems impossible can be. And then I thought, well, where is it that we find that? Where is it that we can begin to hear the bell that seems to make no sound? Where is it that we can think that we can be totally other than we seem to be this day? What is the root of that faith? It's here. It's when we, as the body of Christ, gather together to share in his sacrifice. One of the hallmarks of what distinguishes us from other Christian denominations as Catholics is our belief in the real presence, the fact that the bread and wine that we offer at this altar is transformed through God's grace and the work of the Holy Spirit into the body and blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not a trivial doctrinal fact. That's just not something that we say, well, yes, I believe that, and then move on with our life as though it has no bearing. What this demonstrates to us each and every time we gather is the power of God's grace to do the seemingly unimaginable, to work miracles in our midst, to say that which has no possibility to happen in our world does. It's our encounter with the Eucharist that opens our eyes to faith. It's what allows us to hear the ringing of God's grace in our world. And more than that, it's not just us witnessing something at a distance. For the offertory prayers, which we never hear on Sunday, on weekday masses, you'll hear them. When the priest offers the bread and the wine, Say, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through this goodness, through your goodness, we have this bread and this wine to offer. Fruit of the earth, fruit of the vine, work of human hands. May it become for us our spiritual food and drink. We're acknowledging that the very things we offer to our Lord are first and foremost gifts from him. And yet, not just gifts from him, but the works of our hands. Things that we have formed, encountered, experienced created. And so we don't just offer bread and wine to be transformed, we offer our very selves for our lives are nothing more than his gift, and yet formed by us in our journey, our lives, our struggles, our rejoicing. And so we say, God, if you can transform this bread and wine, you can transform me. And then, as St. Augustine tells us, we truly become what we receive. So if through the lens of faith, if through our hope in what God can do, bread and wine can be transformed, then we too are transformed as his mystical body. 
here present in this world. And we become that very bread, that very wine, a testament to a world of disbelief, a testament to a world of darkness, of pain, of struggle, of suffering, of cynicism, of jaded hearts. To say that the sound of the bell of faith still rings. Now we hear in the prophet Isaiah that all this begins with the emergence of a but. And so in those moments where we say, I just can't see it. How do I grasp it? How do I make sense of it? Where's the signs, God? Show me the miracle. Well, if even the emergence of the glory of his kingdom begins with a simple bud growing, How many of us have been able to witness that fact? A new growth emerging from a root. You could sit there and stare at it all day and it's not gonna look any different. But over the course of time, in the waiting patience we are called to this Advent season, we begin to see it emerge. And slowly, in God's own way, it comes to full flower. So too is that kingdom for which we hope. So too is the potential of our hearts. If we but take the leap of faith to trust in the transforming power of God that we share at his table.